Good evening, everyone. My name is Greg Gorga, Executive Director of your Santa Barbara Maritime Museum. And I want to and welcome you to our lecture tonight, Mapping the History and Ecological Influence of Fishing on Coral Reefs in the Philippines by Dr. Jennifer Selgraf. I also want to thank, uh, I missed our lecture last uh, November, so I want to thank board member Linda Sterling for filling in for me tonight. This is our first of the 2022 year. And of course, I wanna uh, thank our lecture sponsor, Marie Morris Rowe. Hi, Marie, I know you're out there. And I also wanna let you know that this is being recorded by TV Santa Barbara, and it will be up on our website. Usually it takes one or two weeks uh, to get it up there. So of course, you all know we are closed right now, but we will be reopening our doors next Friday, January 28th. Uh, just in time for you to come and enjoy Mermaids, uh, Visualizing the Myths and Legends, Photography by Ralph Clevenger and, and Friends. That exhibit opened in November and will run through March. I also uh, want to let you know that uh, we are very happy to announce that our Ranger, our 104-year-old sport fishing boat, our flagship, was first in its class at the Parade of Lights in December. So very happy and congratulations to our Ranger crew. They did a great job de decorating that boat. Uh, it is wonderful tonight because we do have a very small audience, but we have some marine scientists here tonight. And uh, it just so well connects with the Maritime Museum and all that we do here. We are gonna be doing a marine science program for several countywide schools starting at the end of this month. We have about eight classes, eight days of back scheduled. We do do a program, uh, we will do it again in October called Girls in Ocean Science. We are expanding that to include junior high school students. We uh, had high school students last year. We'll do that again this year. And that is encouraging and inspiring those young women to pursue the marine sciences in college. And of course we do our award nationally recognized Maritime on the Move program, which gets our local uh, youth out there and exploring the, the amazing marine uh, uh, environment in their own backyard. So uh, really nice to have some uh, other marine scientists with us tonight. And I want to announce that our docent training will be going. It's a 10-week docent training program that begins January 29th. Uh, you get uh, 10 classes of history or local history. You will know more about the Maritime Museum and our maritime history than I do uh, if you go through that program. If you are interested in becoming a docent here at the Maritime Museum, working as a docent on deck on our floor, please go to our website, sbmm.org, and you can sign up to be a part of that training program. Again, that starts January 29th. February's lecture is February 17th. It is titled, They Came, They Saw, They Shelled by uh, the amazing Neil Graffy, one of my most favorite local historians, uh, if not the, my favorite. Uh, and that is about the uh, 80th anniversary of the shelling at Elwood uh, at, at during World War II. April is everything about whales here at the Santa Barbara Maritime Museum. We are doing an interactive exhibit called A Whale of a Tale. We are looking for young children, kindergarten through six, uh, to uh, submit artwork for that uh, interactive experience, which will be in our Munger Theater for one full month. Uh, please go again to our website, sbmm.org. The deadline is January 31st uh, to have your, if you have know any young uh, kids, that can uh, do some artwork to be a part of that interactive experience. We are also in uh, April, uh, April 13th to our members and Navigator Circle members, the 15th to the public, opening a series of exhibits on whales. Uh, one is called Whales Are Superheroes. It's part of a countywide collaborative of exhibits, uh, about 11 different museums doing exhibits on climate change. And we're talking about how whales help with climate change. We have a new art exhibit that will take place of the mermaids exhibit called um, The Wonder of Whales, Two Artists Perspectives by John Barron and Kelly Kloss. And then we are going into the schools to do another uh, art program that will be also an uh, art exhibit opening up on April 15th called Whales Are Superheroes Saving the Planet One CO2 Molecule at a Time. Uh, we've already gotten quite a bit of artwork and we will continue to do that education program in the schools. So uh, April is a whale of a month here at the Maritime Museum. Sorry, I just had to do that. Um, uh, and then of course, uh, a lot of you have been hearing about the new tall ship on the West Coast, the Mystic Cruiser, owned by board member uh, Roger Christman and his wife, Sarah, that has arrived at Channel Islands Harbor. And we are looking forward to having that vessel up here 
quite a bit over the summer beginning in May. So uh, again, look at our website to let, uh, we'll let you know when the Mystic Cruiser is coming to Santa Barbara. Hopefully you follow us on Instagram, Facebook, our monthly newsletter currents and on our weekly updates. If not, very easy to sign up. It's just your name and your email address at the bottom of our homepage. I hope you are members of the Maritime Museum, and I especially want to thank our Navigator Circle members and our flagship society members, those who have us in your plan giving. None of the education programs and the wonderful week exhibits we do are possible without your support. Um, and then I want to remind you that this is a Zoom webinar. Please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Maybe it's at the top. Uh, please don't use the chat box for questions. Use the Q&A box. Type in your questions at any time, and then I will be reading them to our speaker after at the end of her presentation. And so it is really my pleasure to welcome Dr. Jennifer Selgraf. She has worked as a spatial ecologist with Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary Science Team since July of 2020. Her work incorporates spatial and social ecological tools into research, monitoring, conservation, and collaborative management of coastal ecosystems. She focuses on human uses of the sanctuary and West, the West Coast Deep Sea Coral Initiative. Prior to joining the sanctuary team, she was a postdoctoral scholar at Stanford University's Hopkins Marine Station, where she used an interdisciplinary historical ecology approach to assess biodiversity changes in Monterey Bay over the past two centuries. She focused on coastal species, including sea otters, sea urchins, kelp, and black abalone. As a postdoc, she also assessed the adaptive capacity of coastal fishing communities to climate change. And it ties in with our climate change exhibit. Uh, Jennifer completed her doctorate degree at the University of British Columbia, where she worked in partnership with Project Seahorse, the Landscape Ecology Lab, and the Zoological Society of London in the Philippines. Her doctoral research focused on understanding long-term changes in the sustainability of small-scale fisheries, the influence of fisheries governance, and the influence of fishing and other stressors on the resilience of coral reefs. Jennifer earned her Master's of Science degree in bi Biology from San Diego State University, Go Aztecs, and her Bachelor's degree from Wesleyan University where she double majored in dance and earth and environmental science. She is a former AmeriCorps volunteer and a former Fulbright scholar. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jennifer Selgraf. So it's really nice to be here tonight. Um, and thanks very much for the introduction, Greg. Although I have been um, recently joined the research team here in Santa Barbara at the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary, I wanted to take everyone tonight on a virtual trip around the world to the Philippines to talk about the oceans and fishing and maritime culture there, which is also a place that I used to live and work. Um, so here in Santa Barbara, the oceans and the islands are an ever-present and delightful part of the community. We have named streets and businesses after places in the ocean and marine life. We, look, we seek out opportunities to look at views of the ocean and ocean sunsets. And we do a lot of activities that are based both in the ocean um, as well as next to the ocean. So for example, I take dance class at East Beach um, on the weekends and I often go paddle boarding and skin diving with friends. My love of the ocean began as a child. I grew up in the beaches in Los Angeles um, where entertainingly I did junior lifeguards at the beach where they also filmed Baywatch, um, which was a fun and quirky part of growing up in LA. Um, when I was young, uh, when I was younger and I started my career as a marine scientist, I thought of the oceans and ecosystems as one entity and the people who came to the ocean as a separate entity. And when I thought about people's role in the ocean, I often about, thought about Baywatch, but jokingly, um, I also thought about things like the wonder that I felt when I went to the ocean and other activities like diving or surfing. And in a way, if you summarize those things, it kind of made me think about things I wanted to do when I was on vacation. Um, but as I started to become a marine scientist and think more deeply about the connections and reciprocal relationships between people and the oceans, I realized that I needed to expand my original perspective. And this meant three things. One, to think more explicitly about how people interact into, with and depend on the rich and dynamic world under the ocean surface. 
Two, to think about the diverse ways that people relate to and depend on the ocean, which means thinking about all of the activities that I just talked about, but also thinking about things like cultural heritage, food security, and blue economies. And three, I needed to transform my initial understanding of the ocean and people as separate entities, and rather to think about them as part of a single dynamic and connected system. So in nerdy academic terms, we call this the social ecological system. And there are many very smart and illuminating ways that people have described this type of a system, but my favorite one comes from Eleanor Ostrom, who won the Nobel Prize in economics for her work in this area. And in the system, as it, um, in this way of thinking about it, we can think about there being different components. So one component is the ocean ecosystem. One is the marine life that lives there. One is the governance system. And another is the people that participate. And um, in amongst the system, there are many different interactions and uh, ways that these different components influence, influence each other. It's also recognized that these things don't happen in isolation. And so any system um, is influenced both by the settings that relate to the people, the social and economic and political settings, um, as well as to related ecosystems. So for example, although we often think about the land ecosystem and the ocean ecosystem as being separate, they are in fact very much connected. So here in California and in the US more broadly, it's, um, it's, the connections that exist in this way can often be hard to see because we can be really removed from the way that we use and depend on natural resources and on the ocean. Um, but so when I started to think about wanting to do this for graduate work, I wanted to seek out a place and an opportunity to be, um, to be in an environment and to do research where people in the ocean's connection was more visible. And ultimately this brought me to the Dinahan Bank which is in the central Visayas in the Philippines in the provinces of Bohol and Cebu. The communities in this area are poor and rural. Many of the villages that I lived in worked in lacked running water and electricity. But even though it is rural, it's also adjacent to the second largest metropolitan area in the country, which is called Cebu City. Um, there's also very high population densities in that island. So for example, in this key that's in the upper left-hand side of the screen, um, is one of the islands that I did research on. Um, instead of having sandy beaches, which is what we usually think about when we think about places like the Florida Keys, um, people had built on all of the land that was there and actually built docks into the water because they'd run out of space. And not all of the Denahut Bank is that crowded, but a lot of it is because there's quite a lot of people that depend on the ecosystem there. Um, the Denahut Bank provides a really excellent place to do research for a variety of reasons. One of them is that the Philippines consistently ranks as a global conservation priority due to the combination of high biodiversity and high threats. And in the Dinahan Bank, um, it's one of only eight double barrier reefs in the world. And it's um, characterized by a coral reef ecosystem. Coral reefs are fascinating and important. They comprise less than 0.1% of the area of the ocean, but they contain about a, a quarter of the species that are found in the ocean, making them an incredibly biodiverse and rich ecosystem. And although they're called coral reefs, they're actually comprised of many different uh, habitats. So that includes coral, but also mangroves and algae and seagrass and sand and rubble. Um, Corals themselves are foundational to the ecosystem though, and they act, they provide shelter for many um, different organisms that live there in a way acting like a large and inviting apartment complex. Um, they're also incredibly important for humans. Um, they provide ecosystem services that range from food production to storm protection, and they benefit millions of people around the world. But reefs are also very fragile. Um, there's many different types of stressors that threaten coral reefs, and some of these include overfishing, habitat degradation, pollution, and climate change. In the Philippines, I worked with a variety of local and international partners, and these included Project Seahorse, um, the Zoological Society of London, in both their international um, office as well as their Philippines office. Um, and in the Philippines, they've worked in these communities for several decades and helped um, support things like sustainable fishing, as well, as well as helping communities establish marine protected areas or MPAs. Um, and I also was a Fulbright scholar when I was there. Um, in the Philippines, most of the fisheries are small scale fisheries, and it's a really great place to understand their influence on the environment. Since the early 90s, um, 
commercial or industrial fisheries have been excluded from the area. So it provides a unique opportunity to look at how small scale fisheries evolve and how they affected the ocean without the corresponding and um, influence of industrial fishing. Small scale fisheries comprise an important subset of global fisheries. They employ the majority of the world's fishers and they catch about half of the food or the marine life that's directly consumed by people, making them incredibly important for both livelihoods and for food security. Um, and so small scale fisheries are considered small in relationship to the industrial fisheries that occur in the same countries. So um, for example, here in Santa Barbara, an example of small scale fisheries would be something like the urchin fishery or the lobster fishery. But what a small scale fishery looks like here is very different than what a small scale fishery looks like in the Philippines. Um, small scale fisheries are characterized by um, catching a diversity of species and the diversity of species that they catch can be mirrored in the diversity of fishing gears that they use to catch them. So fishing can include things like gleaning, which is walking along in the intertidal areas to gather um, often shellfish, um, skin diving, and then things that here in the US we think of as more traditional fishing gears like nets, hook and line gears and traps. There can also be destructive fishing methods. And so for example, in the Philippines where I worked, things like blast fishing and fishing with poison were not uncommon. But despite their importance, small scale fisheries um, often suffer from overfishing and have become degraded through time. And it's not always clear how these fishing practices have evolved from being sustainable and benign to being damaging. And so that's one of the things that my historical research aimed to try to understand. So it's a challenge when you look at an ecosystem and you know that it used to be in one state where it was healthy and then it's currently in a damaged state. And this was true of the Dinahan Bank. When I arrived there, um, the, many of the corals were damaged and the fisheries had quite low catches. But it wasn't entirely clear what happened. And when I talked to different community members, everyone had different ideas. There wasn't a very synthetic view of, of what had happened. Um, and so it's kind of a challenge. And so if you could just take a second and think about it, like if you were to arrive in this type of situation, what type of thing would you do to try and figure out the history of what had happened? So one of the tools that I used is using indigenous and local knowledge, which can provide a really wonderful window into changes that have occurred in the system. And this type of knowledge is based on local community members and resources users, and they're situated and in integrated knowledge about the local environment and their relationship with it. One way to document this is through interviews and participatory mapping. Um, during participatory mapping, community members and resources users use their expert knowledge to draw maps of the distribution of things of interest. And this can include activities like fishing or the distribution of habitats or species. These maps are often created in combination with satellite images or other um, geospatially referenced tools, which allow these participatory maps to be integrated into a geospatial framework. So for my research and for tonight, I'm gonna to talk about five different questions. The first four of which are in the Philippines and the, some, the last one is something I've done more recently, but that's relevant. So for the first question, um, I asked how small scale fisheries evolved through time. And I looked at a few different components of the fisheries. The first one I looked at was the changes in the national government context in the Philippines. Um, to a, a understand how governance changed through time, I evaluated a variety of things, including the levels and organization of power, the aims and values of the fisheries legislation, as well as of development funding, different management tools that were used in different institutions that were a part of governing the, the fisheries. Um, and so based on my research, I divided the decades into four eras, which ranged from very little government involvement, limited government involvement, to a period in the 70s and 80s, when um, the government policies and um, were promoted at maximizing catches, which was quite common around the world at that time. And then more recently, there's been instituted co-management. And co-management is defined as sharing of power and responsibility between the government and local resource users. Although what a local resource user is, is actually often considered very broadly. And so this can include um, different government agencies that partner together non-governmental organizations, research organizations, indigenous groups, and private, private enterprises. Um, in the Philippines, co-management included local governments, nonprofits, different community, and different community groups. 
So then I was interested in seeing how this idea of co-management in the time that I was there was actually getting uh, manifested. So one of the things I looked at was the presence of whether or not communities had locally established marine protected areas, which based under Philippine law were established by local municipalities. And I found that the areas that I worked in, 70% of the village had chosen to set up marine protected areas. I also looked at how many people were members in fishers organizations, which is one of the bodies of management. And I found that only about 20% of the people that I interviewed were, but there was a really large range in membership amongst the different communities that I did work in, ranging from absolutely no one being involved to communities that had quite high membership. So showing that there was a lot of variability in people's participation. Um, and then I also talked to you in a few places tonight about work by my wonderful and fabulous colleague, Dr. Danica Kyber, who also did her work in this area that I think complements some of my work well. And so one of the things that Danica looked at that um, is basic is who actually participated and who was affected by MPAs. And so um, despite the fact that fewer women felt that MPAs had a positive influence on their fishing, they often said that they would recommend them. And that influence, I think typically was because the MPAs that were established tended to be in the shallow areas, which is where the women fishers tended to work, as opposed to in the deeper areas where the more male dominated fisheries were. Women and men reported similar attendance at MPA meetings, but men were four times more likely to actually participate in the discussions and in the management decisions that were made. And participation generally was tied to gendered roles in community work that were held in these communities. I think that this provides a really nice example of how social factors can influence power and benefits in ocean management. So next, I wanna to talk to you about some trends in the, in the fishery, both generally as well as related to specific fishing gears. And to orient you to the area that I worked into the maps we're gonna look at, white is the deep ocean, gray is land, and the speckled area is the reef. I mapped fishing practices in the um, area that's outlined in red. Um, and I interviewed communities which are shown in the black dots that are both located inside of the mapped area as well as up to 10 kilometers outside of the mapped area. The first data source that I used was at Indigenous and Local Knowledge. Um, I had two research assistants that conducted most of the interviews in Visaya, the local language. Um, and these, the two people that I worked with were wonderful. Both had worked as fishermen in the communities that I worked in um, and were both also very active in, in, in their own communities. I conducted interviews in half of the villages in this area and I interviewed 7% of the male fishers in each community. Um, and I both the people that were interviewed as well as the villages were chosen through random sampling that was based on census data that I also collected. Um, I, the interviews were used for both fishing and habitat information, and I also evaluated habitats using remote sensing, which I'll talk about in a little bit. So to kind of give you the rundown of how this worked, I had a base map for, for the, um, the mapping I did that was used, that incorporated a spot satellite image. Um, and so in the image, which was really cool, you could actually see geographic features in the landscape. And so people were able to use those to draw where their fishing grounds were. And so this is what um, one of those fishing grounds would look like once it was digitized. Um, and so for this person in the first year that he fished, these are the areas that he went fishing. And about 10 years later, the places that he fished, um, some of which were similar and some of which were different. So for example, he fished a similar amount in some areas, he fished less in some areas, and he also started fishing in new places that he hadn't fished in previously. And then to look at how um, fishing changed for the whole region, I compiled individual fishing maps to estimate cumulative fishing effort using a combination of the maps and interviews that I'd done in demographic modeling. So first to look at some just trends and effort in the fishery, um, I found that through time, there was fairly consistent effort exerted by individuals. And so here on the x-axis um, is year, and on the y-axis is the um, days per year that an individual went fishing. And that didn't really change through time. Um, in contrast, in the second graph, which looks at total fishing effort, and so now on the y-axis is the total effort from all of the people in these com communities, um, there was a 250% increase through time. And I think it's interesting to look at these two graphs together because you can see that people have talked about there being more fishing pressure and that it was driven by the increasing number of people fishing rather than by changes in individual fishing behavior. Um, I also then looked at maps of fishing effort. And so um, 
The things to pay attention to are areas that are white, means that nobody reported fishing there. And the intensity of the color or how dark pink it is reflects how many days per year people were fishing. And here I'm estimating fishing effort as the days per year fished by the male fishers from the villages where I did interviews. So I'm gonna show you maps from once every decade and each map represents the total fishing effort in one year. So um, you can see a few things through time. First, early on, there were many places that weren't fished and that there was a great expansion in the area that was fished. There was about 160% expansion in fishing area. The next thing you can see through the growing amount of dark pink is that fishing intensity was increasing, but the increases were not spread evenly over the ecosystem. And so they were actually rather concentrated. So for example, in this channel here in 1990, there was a more than 2000% increase in fishing effort. Um, which is the highest amount of fishing effort that was reported in any given time. But later by 2010, some of that effort had dispersed and had moved to the Outer Bank. And I, I assume that some of it also moved out of this mapped area. One of the things that I looked at to, uh, to kind of try and understand this is how many people had engines. So during the same time period, there was an exponential increase in the use of engines and boats, but there still was less than half of the people that were fishing in this area used engines in their boats. So lots of people were paddling or sailing or walking to their fishing grounds. Um, I also wanted to compare our estimates of how fishing effort changed when you use non-spatial metrics and when you use spatial metrics. So this is basically the same graph that we looked at before showing the 250% increase in fishing effort just shown in a different way. And when I then compared it to estimates of spatial fishing effort, the difference was very striking. And I was really surprised to see that there was such a large difference. And so um, because there was this more than 1800% increase when space was considered, the, there, was a, there was order of magnitudes difference um, in, in the amount of fishing effort increase and the amount of fishing pressure that was actually going on in the system. And I think that this can be really important, like considering whether or not it's worth the extra effort to do sp spatial fishing effort because fishing is so um, spatially uh, concentrated. Um, so then now I wanna shift gears a little bit and to talk about fishing gears um, and changes in the use of different fishing gears. The reason that I was interested in doing this is because fishing gears are the way that um, fishing directly impacts the ocean. And this can impact both target species as well as non-target species. And additionally, it can affect habitats. So there's a variety of ways that fishing gears can be categorized. They can include methods. So for example, just regular skin diving and then skin diving with a crowbar are both considered diving. Um, they can also be classified by how intensive they are. So hook and line fishing and diving would be considered non-destructive fishing methods. Whereas blast fishing and diving with a crowbar are both considered uh, destructive fishing methods. So when I looked at general patterns of fishing, I found that there was a really high diversity of fishing gears and people that I interviewed reported using 93 different types of fishing gears, which is quite a lot. Um, on average, an individual used about two and a half gears over their lifetime. But when you looked at um, how many gears people were using at a single time, I found that people tended to use between one and two gears in any given year. And that over time it increased, but it was less than two gears in all the whole time period that I studied. I also looked at the total number of fishing gears in the whole system, and I found that those also increased through time. The largest increase in the number of fishing gears occurred during the productivity period, which as I mentioned before, is when the government was trying to promote maximizing of catches. Um, and so that increases in line with governance, um, governance at the time. But later in, in following years, when there was different priorities of governance, that change didn't occur. And so it, sh it shows that there's a stickiness to things, to changes that happen and to old governance priorities, even as time moves forward. So I also looked at trends in specific fishing gears. Um, so in this graph, year is on the X axis and the Y axis is the total effort um, that was used for each of the different gears. And these four gears that are shown are the most common categories of gear that were used in the area. Um, so early on, um, let's see, uh, nets and hook and line were the most common types of fishing. But over time that changed and nets continued to, to be popular, but diving became one of the most important types of fishing gear. 
whereas um, hook and line fishing and trap fishing didn't change their effort very much over time. Another way that I categorized fishing gear was to look at the, the uh, changes in use of intensive gears. And so I found that gears that were active and non-selective increased through time. And this is probably trying to compensate for declines in catches because of overfishing that was happening or the intensive fishing that was happening. Um, another thing I thought was interesting is here is that I looked at both um, damaging gears or destructive gears and then also at illegal gears. And in 1998, there was a major change in fisheries policy, which made all gears that damaged habitat illegal. And so you can see that there was a sudden increase in the number of people that were using illegal gears, which was due to the changes in legislation rather than to the gears that were being used. But following that change in legislation and in uh, rules, nobody ever stopped using those illegal gears. And so um, it seemed that the, there wasn't a lot of responsiveness to government policies about what types of fishing gear were legal versus illegal. Another change that I looked at was the overlap of fishing gears. And I found that early on, there was very little overlap of gears. So for example, hook and line fishing um, tended to be in deep areas and trap fishing tended to be in shallow areas. But later um, there tended to be a lot of spatial expansion of each of those types of fishing methods so that there was a greater overlap of different fishing methods, which has unknown um, ecological uh, effects. So the second question that I asked about related to fishing is what types of factors influence the spatial fishing patterns? And in particular, I was interested in understanding what, uh, what fishers valued and also what they found difficult about their most important fishing grounds. Um, so based on the interviews, I coded people's responses into a variety of, of um, categories related to fishing ground attributes. And those are shown here on the x-axis. And on the y-axis is the proportion of people that reported um, or that mentioned something in that category. So for positive effects, or uh, qualities of, of important fishing grounds. People mentioned that catch and income, um, distance and safety were all important features of their important fishing grounds. But um, interestingly, they also said that they're important, even though fishing grounds were important, they often could be dangerous. Um, and I think that that really shows the, or I think speaks to the dangerous nature of some types of fishing and being on the open sea. So to summarize the development of fishing, I found the governance change priorities had lasting effects, that illegal gears were still common, and that there was variable participation in co-management. I also found that increasing fishing effort was driven by the growing number of fishers rather than by changes in individual fishing effort. I found incorporating spatial dynamics greatly increased estimates of fishing effort because fishing was quite concentrated, and that there was a growing diversity, intensity, and spatial overlap of fishing gear. I also found that catch distance and safety were important qualities in fishing grounds that people used. The third question that I'm gonna talk about is what is the distribution and cover of coastal habitats? Good maps of habitats are incredibly important because they can illuminate coastal environments. Um, so for example, they can be used to support um, informed decision-making. And right now in California, there's a lot of examples of how that's important. So right now we have the designation of the new wind farms. We have the, they're gonna talk about where to put the new aquaculture program that's going in. And there's the, um, the nomination process for the designation of the proposed Chumash Heritage National Main Sanctuary. And those are all spatial questions. It would benefit from having good habitat maps. Um, Broadly, many high resolution habitat maps only cover really small areas and so they're often not available. Um, and this was definitely true where I worked in the Philippines. Um, and so for this project, I integrated two mapping approaches which were indigenous and local knowledge as well as remote sensing. Um, and one of the reasons I thought it was a cool time to do it is because in the past, um, habitat mapping in the ocean had mostly used the Landsat satellite, which had a 30 meter resolution accuracy or spatial resolution. But a new satellite had been launched, which has now been around for a while, that's called Worldview 2, which had two meter resolution. And so the amount of information that you could get about spatial distributions of habitats was just astronomically higher. I'm not gonna talk about this project in very much detail, um, but I just wanna share one of the results with you, which is that I found that not surprisingly, the reef was very degraded and 85% of the area that could have, been, um, could have been coral 
was actually dominated by rubble and only 15% of the, the reef area had living coral in it. And this brings me to my next question, which is how is the distribution of living corals influenced by fishing and co-occurring stressors? And so um, I used the map of ha maps of habitats and then I took a bunch of spatial variables and looked at and modeled their relationship. Um, and so these other variables included various biophysical and anthropogenic factors, which included things like fishing effort, depth, and human population size. And so this is the result from this, and I'm gonna talk you through it because I know it's an a, a unusual graph. So um, on the x-axis is the, the size of the effect and the variables have been standardized so you can pair directly between them. And then um, on the y-axis is all the variables that were significant in the model. So if the dot um, is on the right side of the, dot, the dashed line, it means that that variable led to more coral or was correlated with more coral. And if it's on the, other, on the left side, it means it's correlated with more rubble. So dots that are black means that the variable was significant and ones that are gray means that they weren't significant. Um, some of the variables that were positively associated with coral cover were depth, um, so a variety of landscape variables, and also marine protected areas. Not surprisingly, blast fishing was negatively associated with the presence of living coral and was positively associated with rubble. But I thought the thing about this that I think is actually cool is that you could see it in the satellite image. Um, then another one that I wanted to talk about is that there were some interactions between variables. So for example, long-term fishing practices over several decades um, had a negative effect on corals, but only when they were in areas that also had high population densities. And I think that the reason for that is probably because long-term fishing tended to remove um, herbivores such as parrotfish from reefs. And in areas where there's high population densities, there's, no, um, there's probably a lot of nutrient pollution because there's no sewage treatment in this area. So that meant that you were just having a continuous amount of nutrients that was added to the reef. And in combination, these tend to lead to algae dominated reefs and dead reefs. Um, so to summarize my research findings from the work in the Philippines, I have found that um, in the realm of governance, there was changing priorities through time, that past governance policies and priorities could have lasting effects. The illegal gears were still quite common. Um, the MPAs were a popular management tool and that co-management participation varied. In the area of fishing, I found that more fishers led to increasing effort, that fishing had an, was occurring in an expanding area and that the methods or fishing gears had diversified, intensified, and also had a growing spatial overlap through time. I found that there was um, fairly low coral cover and I found that corals were more likely, living corals were more likely to occur in deeper areas, in protected areas, and, in, um, and that fishing had a variety of short-term and long-term effects on whether or not you had found living corals in an area. So some of the conservation implications from this include that there are good laws that exist, but they need better implementation and enforcement. Um, also that the growing population is leading to greater pressure on the reef. Um, in response to that, people have been using more intensive fishing methods, which can often be less sustainable. Um, and so that's like another area that I think that there could be work done in. Um, and I did think it was also interesting that people tended to not switch fishing gears over the course of their career, which it shows that if you target or you work with young fishers and get them to use sustainable methods, I think that there's an opportunity to encourage a next generation of more sustainable fishing than currently um, happens. Um, I also found that historical and, and also spatial perspectives can support ocean conservation. The historical perspectives provide baselines, and it can be critical that to capture existing indigenous and local knowledge while it's available. Um, I did some of these interviews a while ago, and I think that a lot of the people that were more elderly that I interviewed may not still be there today to talk about what they saw in the past. Um, so now I want to come back again to the idea of a social ecological system, but to think about some of the settings that in um, sort of outside changes that were occurring when these changes were going on in the ecosystem. 
So a couple of things that were happening. One is that there was increasing human populations around the whole world, which means that there's more people with a greater demand for marine resources and a greater influence on ecosystems just broadly, not just in this area that I worked in. Um, there's also a rising influence of the global markets. And there's some people that have done some very smart and savvy research about this, but I thought I'd just share a couple of anecdotal stories that I have. So one of them um, is related to the aquarium fishery which is one of the common types of fishing that occurs in the Philippines. It's done usually through a mix of skin diving and traps, although people also use poison. So sometimes it can be very unsustainable. Um, those fish are typically caught and bagged, put into bags that they add oxygen to and shipped off. So this is a box of uh, fish that was getting, that I bumped into in the Manila airport at some point. Um, and then the first time I was in the Philippines, I had some meetings in Hong Kong um, because Project Seahorse works in the traditional Chinese medicine trade as well. And so when I was there, I was wandering around the aquarium district and I found these little plastic bags with reef fish in it that looked just like the ones that I had seen in the Dinahan Bank. Um, and so it was just like a really striking uh, sort of link between the reef where I worked and the fishing that was going on there and this foreign market in a city. And I gave an example from Hong Kong, but this certainly, there's people, certainly US markets that are driving this as well. And I happen to have worked at an aquarium that also sourced their reef fish from the Dinahan Bank. So it's not, it's not just Hong Kong. Um, another example um, comes from seahorse fisheries and seahorse fisheries are often, seahorses are often caught as bycatch in other fisheries. So one day I was out fishing with somebody who was crowbar skin diving um, and he was looking for abalone. And so he found abalone, but he also found us the seahorse, which he cleverly put in this plastic bottle to hang onto it, which I thought was kind of cool. Um, and seahorses are very valuable. And so um, they're often, they're dried locally in the Dinahan Bank and then sent abroad where you can find them in um, often in traditional Chinese medicine markets. Um, we, they're a little bit used for things like curiosities, like a keychain or something, but that traditional Chinese medicine is the main driver of their trade. Um, and so again, this is another picture I took from that trip to Hong Kong, which I just happened to have on hand, but you can find the same things again in the US and in many countries around the world. Another thing that um, I really thought about through the course of my research is how much who is counted and who's measured influences what we see and the types of patterns that we see in uses of the ocean. So the research that I did focused on fisheries that were done by men um, and uh, and often that, that's sort of a more typical type of fishing that we think about. But women were an important part of fishing that's often not very well documented. Um, and I think it's important to think about this because the type of people that we um, do exclude or don't take in, collect information on can influence what we think. So for example, in this report that by the IUCN that was done, they talked about how information about women's role and access and environment related sectors is often not collected or reported. And so it's just not considered. Um, and again, coming back to um, some of the research of Dr. Kleiber, um, she did some reviews that found that women fish all over the world, even though they're often not considered. And I wanna point out that in this map, um, Santa Barbara also has women fishermen, but we're not actually on the map. So there's even more than um, are, are present in this, in this review. But what's often missing is just data about, about women fishing. And in, in Dr. Kleiber's work in the um, Tanahan Bank, where I was working, we were there about the same time. And she found that women fish quite a lot. And in fact, were responsible for about a quarter of the, the catch by weight that was collected. They also catch a lot of the biodiversity because they catch a lot of different uh, varieties of invertebrates. Some other changes that were going on is that uh, the use of oceans was evolving through time. One of the things that was happening as I was there and has continued to happen is the rise of seaweed farming, which is a type of aquaculture. The, one of the really good things about this is that it's an alternative livelihood to offset the declines in fisheries and can be really valuable um, for coastal communities. In the areas that I worked in, um, fishing tended to be, or, uh, seaweed farming tended to be small scale. And so it was often done by little people with small, small farms that were near their houses. But one of the downsides of this is that there's a loss of common ocean spaces. And so areas that were previously um, common, common pool resources that many people fished in were now given to one individual or family with a lease. 
And in the way that it was done here in the Philippines, um, in, in the Denaham Bank, there wasn't a lot of thought put into it. It just happened to be who showed up first to get a license um, could, could be given an area without a, a broader sort of think about what that might mean or what areas might be important to maintain as fishing grounds. Another cool project that's been going on in the Denaham Bank is a project called Networks that's um, supported by Interface Carpet, um, which you can buy here in California. And they basically decided that they needed a lot of uh, nylon to make into carpets. And so they were looking for a, a reusable source and it ends, and ends up you can turn old fishing nets into new carpet. And so there's this program that started that occurs in many of the different communities in the Denaham Bank and other parts of the Philippines. That's taken hundreds of tons of old fishing nets um, and turned them into carpet. And part of the program also integrates community banking. And so it's been helpful in um, having and helping community members save money and, and do some other good things as well. So in the work that I've done, um, I've often tried to link research uh, to management and to restoration through a variety of things, including building local partnerships, organizing trainings and strategic plannings, being involved with communities, um, and also trying to think about helping communities think about preparing for climate change. And so to go back to these list of stressors that threaten coral reefs and oceans more broadly, when we've kind of talked about overfishing and habitat degradation, as well as nutrient pollution, which is one type of pollution, but we haven't yet talked about climate change. And I was, as I was preparing this talk and starting to think about what I wanted to talk about, um, the timing of that was in some ways kind of unfortunate because um, while I was doing that, um, this as you may have heard, there was a super typhoon that hit the Philippines right before Christmas, about a month ago. And um, it happened to actually, the main area that was impacted was the Denahan Bank, the area that I did research in. Um, and so it was an incredibly sort of personal and close example of how the increase in major storms that's driven by climate change affects um, people. And so these are, um, the photographs were sent to me by my old research assistant, Jerry Sacano, of um, the community that he lives in and how it was affected by the typhoon. And to briefly bring this back to research, um, it actually makes me think about some of the work I did while as a postdoc at Stanford um, with my lab group there, um, where we did a global review of how communities responded when they were impacted, like things like typhoons that happened in response to climate change. And we found that there was a large variation in the ways that communities responded. And we classified these responses into three categories. One was coping, which is passively accepting the consequences of environmental disasters, such as the typhoon. One was reacting, which is an unplanned response to a stressor or change. And the other one was adapting, which is proactive planning of an individual or collective action um, that's based on the knowledge of past or anticipated future change. So it's both either that something bad has happened in the past or that people are anticipating that there might be problems in the future. Um, and so one of the things that we did was identify combinations of factors that led to adaptive behavior. And this is, um, can be important to understand because it can be possible to support those qualities in order to help people understand and prepare for, for climate change impacts in the future. So um, the things that we've, there were a variety of things that help, that combinations of things that led to adaptive responses. Some that were common in many of the, the um, case studies were things like good governance or good institutions and diversity and flexibility of the communities um, or households. Um, at the community scale, having access to assets was incredibly important because it helped communities do things like rebuild infrastructure like roads or piers. Um, that wasn't so important at the household level, but at the household level, what was important was having um, things like learning and knowledge or else act natural capital. And I think that um, those two sort of provide opportunities for a household to pivot and how they're um, making their livelihoods or what they're, what they're doing and, and allows them to respond more um, rapidly to change and to think, to, think in, to think ahead for what might happen in the future. 
So coming back to Santa Barbara, I think it's important to recognize that we're not immune to any of these potential changes in the ocean and that many changes are going on underneath the surface of the ocean as we speak. Like there certainly are effects of climate change that are affecting the oceans here. And even though it might seem like our connection to the ocean lies in the realm of vacation, um, in fact, we're, many, we're connected to the ocean in many ways that are both deep and multifaceted. And moving forward, I think we can support our own capacity to adapt to changes that are occurring in the ocean, including climate change, by having a good understanding of our history, of our uses, and of spatial patterns of use, and by incorporating that knowledge into um, it, incorporating the knowledge that we hold in this community and by following the same principles of local partnerships, community engagement, and planning for future climate impacts. And um, so as Greg said, as he introduced me, I'm now working for the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary. And one of the reasons that I was really excited to come and to join the staff here was in, because in fact, the sanctuary program is designed to include many of those ideas. Um, for example, through the Sanctuary Advisory Council, was a, which is a council that helps advise the sanctuary management and is based on people, um, community members from a variety of different groups and perspectives. Um, and to integrate those into sanctuary management. And if that's something that interests you, it just so happens that tomorrow morning we're having a, a Sanctuary Advisory Council meeting, which you are welcome to come to. Um, so as I'm here, I'm working with the research team to use a similar research framework to try and understand communities and ecosystem services, and also to map uncharted habitats. So some of the programs that I'm working on include documenting activities, uses, and participation in sanctuary management. Um, also trying to document and support cultural heritage and indigenous and local knowledge. Um, I'm working on some of the deep sea coral program, which um, you maybe heard Lizzie Duncan's talk um, recently here at the museum, which went more into depth on that. Um, and I think it's interesting that here in the Channel Islands and in Santa Barbara, we have coral reefs as well, which also were not very well mapped. Here it's because they occur in very deep ecosystems that are hard to, to access um, and hard to look at. But similar to their tropical cousins, these reefs serve as important habitat for fish and for other marine life, and they support the productivity of the ocean in Santa Barbara. Um, and then I also am working um, in Santa Barbara and also nationally to try and strategize about how to assess and manage current and future impacts from climate change and to test potential indicators of how communities and tribal groups in the Santa Barbara area might be impacted by climate change. Um, and since I'm relatively new here, a lot of this work is just getting started. So I'm looking forward to working with many of you on these projects going forward. Um, so with that, I wanted to thank um, my, many of my collaborators, and in particular, my advisors um, for my PhD, Dr. Amanda Vincent and Dr. Sarah Gergel. Um, I also want to thank the communities from the Danahan Bank that were participated in my research and my research, research assistants without whom I couldn't have done this. Um, and so in normal situations, I would just end my talk here, but in light of the fact that this typhoon did just hit the area that I worked in in the Philippines, I also wanted to um, take this opportunity to just sort of to offer an opportunity to donate money to the communities there. Because um, although its appearance in the news was brief, there's still an intense recovery effort that's going on in the region. And I'm sure everyone here tonight cares about the ocean and about ocean communities. Um, so I thought I'd bring your attention to that. Um, I've talked with my colleagues at the Zoological Society of London um, in their Philippines office. And so whatever, uh, if, if, you, if people would like to donate money, I'm just gonna send it to them for the work that they're doing in the communities there. So with that, I wanna say thank you so much for your generosity and for your support and for coming to my talk tonight. And now I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks. Thank you, Jennifer, that was wonderful. Uh, and uh, and uh, certainly, um, I hope we can uh, help those folks there in, in the Philippines. So I do have some questions for you. Uh, I warned you that there would be lots of questions, right? Absolutely. All right. All right. The first one is for, from Jason, who actually works in our education department here. She's, mm -hmm. He asks, can you talk a little bit about your on-the-ground research logistics and challenges doing this work in areas without power and services? What are some of the tools used for the recording interviews, gathering data, taking notes, mapping, compiling, uh, lots of notebooks and pencils for tech input later on was his question. Yeah, that's lots of pieces, but I can talk about some of those. Um, 
So when I got there, um, you know, we live in a world where we have cell phones that tell us where we are located and where everything we might want to know where it is. But the maps that I could find that were the nationally published maps at that time, and, and it has gotten better since, since then, but um, they actually didn't even have the right locations of all of the, the barangays or village, which is the local word for village or neighborhood where I was working. So I couldn't even start a process of random sampling because I didn't actually know where there were communities that I wanted to be working in. So I actually took a GPS unit um, and I had lots of local assist, research assistants, which was great. And we'd hire um, a hobble hobble, which is like a motorcycle driver basically. And I would drive around to different areas and based on the local people um, that I was working with, would go visit the um, village leadership in different communities and basically take GPS points of the places that I was so that I can make a map of where things were located because there wasn't, there wasn't that type of information. Um, you know, and then other ways, um, I decided to do all the mapping in paper. There, there are newer technologies. Like I saw a really cool talk by a woman who works in Africa and she's worked with a startup in San Francisco and there's QR codes that are on the maps that she can take a picture of them and send them to off and they just digitize them automatically for her. But that didn't exist, unfortunately. So <laughs> I spent a lot of time, um, I had a lot of research assistants that helped me like manually digitize all of the paper maps that we drew. Um, we did them on tracing paper instead of digi digitally, which would have been a much faster and more efficient way to do it. But there just wasn't the consistent power to be able to do that at the time. Um, so I think that's a, a few, answering a few of those questions. All right, thank you. So yeah. next question is, how did you end up deciding your timeline from 1950s onward do the remnants of influence of imperial governments of Spain from the 1500s through the early 1900s and then the U.S. later on and their policies have any lasting effects on fisheries? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I would say that it really was just a pragmatic question because I, the research that I showed you started in 1950. I interviewed people back as far as they could remember and I um, I, I tried to select a combination of people that were older and would have longer memories and then younger that would have more, be up on more recent things that were happening. But um, I think that the oldest, it's been a bit since I've looked at it. The oldest person I think started fishing in 1948, but it was only a sample of one. So I wasn't really able to look at the synthetic vision of what was going on in the fishery till 1960, which is when I had enough respondents that I felt like I was getting a meaningful um, view of what was happening. Um, certainly the Philippines has a long history of being colonized by a variety of different countries, including Spain and the United States. Um, but, um, and, and those things did affect it. Like the history of blast fishing, which is the fishing with explosives actually came from World War II because some of the munition powder that was left over, people realized that they could turn into bombs and that they could throw those into schools of refish and it would be really efficient. And these days they use fertilizer to make those bombs. They don't use old gunpowder, but it, it started from the history of war in the country. All right, thank you. Our next question comes from Amanda, who's a board member here and past president. Can you explain more about how a fish population impacts a reef? For example, parrotfish eat the corals for nutrients and create sand. Wouldn't the decrease in parrotfish mean an increase in corals? Yeah, so parrotfish are actually are herbivores, um, but they're, they help stabilize reefs because they have these big beaks. And when they eat the, the algae, um, it also scrapes off the unstable parts of the reef, but they're not trying to eat the corals themselves. That's sort of a byproduct of their feeding method. And one of the reasons that the um, parrotfish are important is because they help to um, keep down um, algae populations. And so in this sort of a dynamic fight between algae and coral for space, the parrotfish is on the side of the coral and they help the coral be more dominant versus the algae be more dominant. All right, thank you. Uh, there's a great deal of information is uh, over of your information is over 10 years old. Do you, uh, do you believe the conclusions are still valid based on the original research? Yeah, and so um, I started tonight by talking about some work that I did a while ago, um, I think in part because I'm sort of new here and I'm getting going in the research that I'm doing here. And also because I thought it was interesting to look at it. Um, I have been working in the Philippines more recently than I did this study. So I would say that there are um, 
some ways that things have changed. Like for example, um, when I fished there or, or when I worked there, people that fish a lot with kerosene lights, um, which are is actually a shockingly useful way to illuminate the underwater at night. But there's been a large switch to flashlight fishing. So for a lot of the nocturnal fisheries, they're using underwater dive lights as opposed to kerosene lanterns that they were using 10 years ago. Um, the population has grown. Um, there's but a lot of the things are still similar. Um, when I was, I was last there about three years ago, just a bit before COVID and um, in, in some of the villages that I worked in, cause I went back and had some community meetings and it's surprising how much things are, are similar since that time. They, like they, you know, everyone changes, but, but nothing too dramatic. Um, I do think it would be really interesting to go back and to repeat the study looking at 10 or 20 years since the, since the original original one was done, but I haven't had the opportunity to do that yet. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Did you find the fishing in the Philippine Sea conflict between the Philippines and China affect the fisheries you studied or were you far away enough where that wasn't relevant? Yeah, so I worked in the central Visayas region, which is if the Philippines is an archipelago, um, it's like right in the middle. So it's surrounded by tons of different islands. So the South China Sea conflict is on the outside of the country um, to the west. So in this project, I didn't, um, there wasn't any influence of that where I worked. I did spend a month working in um, Tubataha, which is a really amazing big um, UNESCO World Heritage Site that's a marine protected area that's further um, to the west. And when I was there, I lived at a ranger station with a bunch of people that were in the Philippine Navy and Coast Guard, who sometimes were stationed at the, at the, in the South China Sea where that conflict exists. But it has it's escalated since then. China has been taking uh, more serious steps to stake their claims. So it, it didn't affect the fishing, but it was definitely something that was going on and like around at the time that I was there. Thank you. Um, how about what is this? Uh, how much damage to the coral do these typhoons cause? That's a really good question. Um, it depends on how the corals hit the reefs. Um, and I think in the case, they can often break apart, especially branching corals um, can be really sensitive to the big waves and storms. Um, I'm not actually not sure. Um, I tried to get a grant. There was a, this is actually the second super typhoon in the last decade that's hit the area, and um, we talked about doing a project to look at that in this area more explicitly, and just uh, didn't have it. We weren't able to do enough fundraising to look at it explicitly, but I suspect that it probably is less than in other areas because the reef is so degraded already. There's not a lot of of large structures. So I think it affects the coastal intertidal, uh, the kind of shallow areas more than some of the reef structures, just because there's not that that much. But but certainly it 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 knocks over corals. All right, thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. So another question is the population at the, in the Philippines from 1960 to, to 2020 has grown four times. Is that factored in this, uh, in the effect of your that you studied? Yeah, it was, and I. Um, so some of the uh, um, estimates that I did of um, how the fishing efforts changed was based on the census data, which is, is just that. Um, and so there was both shifts in the overall population. And at the same time, there was a shift from more rural-based populations to more urban-based populations. So there were sort of these two dynamics going on at the same time that both affected the population and the number of people that were actually living in the Denahan Bank region. So um, you talked a little bit about possibly doing another study in 20 years, but is there a uh, question is, is there any work that is or, or was underway to extend your work and what are some of the future goals and hopeful outcomes for the area? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I, um, I, <laughs> In the world of science, what you can fund is, is always like a major limitation of what you are or are not able to do. So when I was a postdoc, um, we did start to do a project to look at, to take some of the ideas of the, um, the dynamics that I found and to look, use survey data from across the country to look at how reefs changed and, and were affected by various impacts. But we weren't able, 
we, we did, I worked on it for about two months and we weren't able to get more funding to do it. So I think it's something, I think there's a lot of really interesting follow-up questions that could be done. Um, there are, however, some really cool projects going on. Like my old lab mate, um, Dr. Jonathan Antikvara, who's a professor now at UP, um, uh, uh, gosh, I'm blanking on his name, but the university that's in Manila, he does really extensive coral reef surveys um, around the whole country and has been doing a lot to, to increase our knowledge about the functioning of reefs across the whole archipelago. So there's a lot of really neat stuff going on by my by uh, Filipino scientists, even now during the pandemic. Okay. And then um, a couple more. Uh, so what would better look like in the respect to the corals and fisheries and are the, the local people there uh, committed or, or will are able to help improve the coral and fisheries? Yeah, I would say that that largely varies based on the communities. Um, and so I work in some communities that were really, really dedicated to having sustainable fisheries that were, that had volunteers that, so in the, in all the NPAs, they have guard houses. And so the fishers organizations, one of the things that they do is that they volunteer every night of the month um, to sleep in the guardhouse to make sure that to ward off people that are trying to legally fish there at night. So there's actually like a really large amount of personal commitment that comes to setting up a marine protected area and to keeping it protected. That's based on local people um, rather than on some outside entity protecting it. Um, but there were other communities that I went in that, that didn't just didn't really care. And so for example, um, blast fishing, which is the fishing with explosives tended to occur in really specific communities. So there was about four communities that, it, that I studied that had them. And those communities, they were interesting. They, they always had a bit of a different flair. Like I felt like there was more gambling, there was more alcoholism and, and other social problems that I often found were much more common in those communities, at least from a superficial, um, a glance or just visiting them for a few days when I was doing surveys there. Um, but so I would say that there's those communities aside though, like people are very committed to making the ocean better. And like, I think the widespread uptake of MPAs is a really great example of that because they are, they are dependent on the resources that are, um, are next to their communities. And so the state of them is, is something that they care about very much. Okay, uh, Amanda says that climate change causes an increase in water temperatures. Is it the higher water temperature that is causing the bleaching of corals, or is the increase in the CO2 gases causing an increase in the acidity of the oceans contributing to more bleaching? So bleaching um, itself is driven by increases in temperature in the ocean. And so corals are really cool. In a way, they're sort of a mix of animal, vegetable, and mineral because they're the skeleton that's been excreted by the animal. They're the coral animal itself. And then inside of the tissues of the coral is a, um, a is something called a zooxanthellae, which basically photosynthesizes and feeds the coral. And so that way the corals host them um, and they have this relationship where the zooxanthellae get um, a shelter and the coral gets food. And that's what allows corals to be able to have enough extra energy to build the reefs. But um, when the temperature of the water gets hot, the zooxanthellae start excreting something that's poisonous to the corals, which basically causes the corals to kick them out because they, um, it's no longer beneficial for the corals to have them in their tissues. And that loss of the zooxanthellae is actually the thing that causes corals to bleach because it's the zooxanthellae of algae that give the corals their color. Um, and so it, it is linked to temperature. Um, By the way, Michelle, who used to work for us, immigrated from the Philippines uh, from Boracay, Calibo. So she says, thank you for the Typhoon Link relief, which I did just put in the chat. Uh, and her barangay uh, luckily came out unscathed. All right, Bill, okay. would like to, yeah. uh, Bill would like to know, what, with what you learned in the Philippines, how can we do enhanced mapping in deep reef areas? So my um, work in the Philippines mostly um, was based on mapping shallow areas because the satellite images 
um, because it's it's basically looking from the surface down through the water column to the seafloor. It's only able that technology is only able to map shallow habitats and in areas where the water is relatively clear. So, for example, you can use um, satellites to map corals because corals tend to be in clear water, but it's harder to use them to map things like kelp forests or seagrass that we have here because our water here tends to have more plankton and other things in it that make this the um, sense satellite sensor not able to penetrate the water column. So in places where there's deeper water, we often use different types of technology. Um, and some of that's based on acoustics or radar. Um, and uh, or else you can use it by doing, um, often there'll be like things like ROV surveys, which are unmanned submarines that will go and take videos of the seafloor. So there's sort of, there's a whole other suite of methods that are used to map the seafloor in deep areas as opposed to in um, coral reefs. All right, just two more questions, but lots of kudos from different people, just so you know, on the presentation and all your research. Eddie would like to know what was your biggest setback in your research? Oh, goodness. That, I'm sure, is actually in the habitat mapping chapter. Um, I uh, originally had gotten advice that wasn't very good, uh, that using uh, one type of satellite image would be really, really great for my research, but it ends up that very few people had used it. It's the spot satellite images. They're great. They're higher spatial resolution than Landsat, but they um, there's some technical things. Basically, um, the red band doesn't penetrate water because um, it just can show you things above the surface. And so a lot of the bands of many different satellites are designed to map things that are on land and not to map things in the ocean. So to effectively map things in the ocean, you need to have more um, uh, of the cameras be in parts of the light spectrum that penetrate the water. I know that's a bit technical, but um, so anyways, I got, I, did, I wrote this big grant. I got all these, this, I got, um, I think like 15 years of satellite images and I was all set to look at how the reefs changed over time with the fishing, only to discover that I was getting incredibly low accuracy. It was actually much, it was random map, just randomly assigning habitats to the map was more effective than any of the, the methods that I could use. So I basically had to give up on that. And that made, led me to seek, um, and, and then right at that time is when the Worldview 2 satellite got launched, which was able to do a much better job. And I was able to set up a partnership with um, a scientist named Chris Rasima, who's in Brisbane at the University of Queensland. And um, he uh, is actually one of the foremost experts in mapping coral reefs in the world. And he just developed this new method. He decided he wanted, he was excited to try out in the Dinahan Bank. So it was a part of my thesis that totally didn't go according to plan. And I ended up having to ask very different questions, but it ended up being a really neat opportunity to kind of push some of the new technology forward. So is, you know, everything that doesn't work out leads to new opportunities, I suppose. All right, well, thank you. Uh, last question from Lisa, were the results of your research shared with the people with whom you interviewed uh, in the Philippines? And if so, are any behaviors expected to change there? Yeah, and so um, I would, so my, um, my research has been shared with, um, I went back a few years ago and I had meetings in some of the communities that I worked in. Um, and then I also had meetings with, I've had meetings with the National Fisheries Agency staff, as well as with um, people in several of the nonprofits that do community-based management in that area. And so we have developed some different strategies of how the information that I found that I talked to you about tonight can be incorporated into some of the management and some of the things that are going on with partnerships. So the, for example, the importance of getting young fishers to use sustainable fishing methods is one of the things that people have been trying to adopt um, in the area that I worked in. All right, well, thank you very much, Jennifer. I do have a very nice gift for you on oh, behalf of the museum. And I want to uh, thank all of you out there in our audience. Uh, we will be back open next Friday. Please come in and see the mermaid photography exhibit if you have not done so already. And remember, February 17th, we have Neil Graffy talking about the 80th anniversary of the Elwood Shelling. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night. Mm -hmm.